Controlled Environment Plant Production Engineering and Technology Education Modules are developed and presented by the Ohio State University, Rutgers, and the University of Arizona with support from USDA and NEFA through their Higher Education Challenge Grant Program. This module is developed and presented by Dr. Murat Kassira from University of Arizona and Dr. A.J. Boat from Rutgers. In the first part of the psychrometrics and processes module, uh, we looked at some of the key definitions of psychrometrics and discussed about thermodynamic properties of moist air. We learned about psychrometric chart and uh, also uh, using the psychrometric chart to locate uh, the state, uh, thermodynamic state, as well as uh, finding some of the uh, thermodynamic uh, properties of moist air. In the second part of this module, we are going to look at uh, some of the example uh, air conditioning and common psychrometric uh, processes. Uh, and we will be using psychrometric chart as well in our discussions. Uh, let's now look at some of the examples of uh, using uh, the psychrometric chart to uh, fix the thermodynamic state uh, by uh, knowing uh, two um, uh, thermodynamic properties of the air and we will uh, see how we can determine other uh, uh, thermodynamic properties of uh, moist air at the uh, fixed uh, thermodynamic state. So in this example, uh, we're given a dry bulb temperature of 25 degrees Celsius and a wet bulb temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, we are asked to determine the relative humidity of the air, dew point temperature, humidity ratio, specific volume, and uh, the specific enthalpy of the air at the uh, at this uh, thermodynamic uh, state. So let's look at our psychrometric chart and first uh, let's fix the thermodynamic state by the given uh, thermodynamic properties of the moist air at dry bulb temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. We can locate it on the psychrometric chart here and we can move uh, upward vertically uh, to cross the uh, 20 degrees Celsius wet bulb temperature that we locate here on this uh, scale and as you remember we follow the green we follow the green uh, dashed uh, diagonal lines for wet bulb temperature uh, remember they were here so we can cross uh, these two lines to locate our current uh, thermodynamic state so when we determine our state, then we can go around the scale on the psychrometric chart to locate the other uh, thermodynamic properties of moist air. For example, uh, if you look at the relative humidity uh, at this uh, state, uh, you can see that uh, the relative humidity uh, is 63% or following the black uh, diagonal lines, to reach the uh, enthalpy scale, we can determine that the specific enthalpy of air at this state is 57.5 kilojoules per kilogram dry air. And following the blue diagonal lines here to find the specific volume, we can determine that at this uh, state, the specific volume is 0.862 meters cube uh, per kilogram dry air. And we can also move uh, to the right on the psychrometric chart at constant um, uh, humidity ratio or horizontally we can uh, move to the right to uh, locate the humidity ratio or the absolute humidity using the vertical scale here and our humidity ratio is 12.6 grams of water per, kilo per kilogram of uh, dry uh, air. Uh, we can also locate the dew point temperature. You can uh, move uh, horizontally uh, to the right here and on the uh, left hand side of this vertical scale the dew point temperatures are located so you can determine that the uh, dew point temperature is about 17.6 uh, degrees uh, Celsius. Finally, we can also move horizontally to the right 
and determine our current vapor pressure, uh, which is about 14.4 uh, millimeters of uh, mercury at this thermodynamic state. As you can see, we only need to know two thermodynamic properties of moist air to be able to determine all other uh, properties of the uh, moist air uh, mixture using the psychrometric chart. So uh, this slide uh, basically summarizes uh, the values that we found uh, for all other thermodynamic properties of the air at the given uh, thermodynamic state by the dry bulb temperature and wet bulb temperature. So our findings are presented uh, by the, the values shown uh, with the red color here. Uh, let's look at another example here, uh, and in this example, um, uh, we are given two thermodynamic uh, state points uh, with two uh, different thermodynamic properties uh, of uh, each state, and uh, the given values are represented by the the values in black color here, and we are asked to determine uh, thermodynamic properties of moist air at the two different state, and uh, then uh, we will determine the process line uh, using the psychrometric chart. So the first uh, state point is fixed by the 40 degrees Celsius dry bulb temperature as well as the humidity ratio of 14 grams of water per kilogram of dry air. And if you look at the psychrometric chart uh, using the procedure that was uh, described in the earlier uh, slides, uh, that state is fixed on the psychrometric chart shown by this uh, light blue uh, point. And uh, at that state, if you move around the psychrometric chart using the procedure described uh, previously, you can determine that your wet bulb temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, the point of 19.1 degrees Celsius, and relative humidity is 30%, again on this line, on this uh, state point. And the enthalpy, specific enthalpy, is 76 kilojoules per kilogram, and uh, the specific volume is 0 0.907 uh, meters cube uh, per kilogram dry air at this uh, state point. Uh, you can also locate the uh, current uh, vapor pressure uh, by going to the right of the uh, to the right of this uh, state point and locating the vapor pressure on the vapor pressure scale, and that's about 16.5 millimeters uh, mercury. Uh, and uh, using the unit conversion, uh, uh, we can uh, determine the uh, pressure, the, such, uh, the vapor pressure uh, in terms of kilopascal units, and that's about 2.23 uh, kilopascal for this uh, initial uh, state. The final state uh, is given by the uh, dry bulb temperature of 25 degrees Celsius and uh, a specific volume of 0.85 uh, meters cubed per kilogram. And as you can see on the psychrometric chart, that uh, state point two is located uh, here, uh, shown with the yellow dot. And at this state, uh, the uh, thermodynamic properties of the air are uh, the wet bulb temperature of 12.5 degrees Celsius. The D point temperature is about uh, 0.67 degrees Celsius and relative humidity is 20.7% and a humidity ratio is about uh, 3.9 grams per kilogram and enthalpy is about uh, 35 kilojoules per kilogram. And if you uh, move to the um, vapor pressure uh, scale here uh, by uh, going uh, uh, horizontally to the right of the psychrometric chart and you can determine the vapor pressure uh, to be 4.8 millimeters mercury or 0 0.64 uh, kilopascal. So our initial point is fixed here, and the final uh, state point is fixed uh, here on the psychrometric chart. And as you can see, we go through um, uh, um, an evaporation process or um, dehumidification process, 
and then uh, through a sensible cooling process. So the process line is basically uh, represented by this uh, uh, red line on the psychrometric chart. So as you can see, uh, using the psychrometric chart, we can determine uh, property changes uh, that are caused by the system or the processes. Uh, we can design heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems based on heating, cooling needs to achieve a desired state point. Uh, we can also determine system efficiencies. Uh, furthermore, we can uh, determine energy changes related to moist air properties and the systems that uh, that change them uh, through, for example, ventilation, eruptive cooling, or uh, heating uh, processes. So let's look at some of the air conditioning processes or uh, psychrometric processes uh, uh, using the psychrometric chart, uh, depending on where the initial, initial state is fixed and how we move from this initial state to a final state uh, defines the uh, process uh, line and the process uh, itself. So let's assume that we are uh, uh, located at an initial thermodynamic state shown by this red dot and if we uh, follow a constant uh, humidity ratio uh, process uh, just uh, increasing the uh, dry bulb temperature uh, we go through a sensible uh, heating uh, process where the humidity ratio remains the constant and the opposite direction uh, defines a sensible cooling process. Again, during this process, the humidity ratio or the absolute humidity of the air remains constant while the uh, dry bulb temperature is reduced. Um, if uh, we move upward uh, on the psychrometric chart, as you can see, we go through a humidification process. Uh, the dry bulb temperature does not change uh, during this process. Uh, however, the humidity ratio is increased as we add more moisture, more water uh, into the uh, air. The opposite direction defines the dehumidification process. Again, uh, the dry bulb temperature remains constant uh, while the uh, uh, humidity ratio is uh, decreased. Uh, moving diagonally from the initial uh, state point, as you can see here, uh, this way we can go, we can uh, cool the air as well as uh, um, go through uh, the humidification uh, process. In the opposite direction, uh, we define a heating and humidification uh, process. So as you can see here, depending on where we are uh, located at the initial state and how the final state is defined by the thermodynamic uh, state properties, uh, we define a psychrometric process or air conditioning uh, process. And we can easily track these processes and using psychrometric chart we can determine all the related thermodynamic state properties without going through some exhaustive uh, theoretical calculations of the uh, properties uh, and uh, determine how much cooling and how much heating or how much humidification and dehumidification uh, is achieved through a given uh, air conditioning process. Um, uh, in in uh, modeling uh, of air conditioning uh, processes, um, uh, we can use um, uh, the modeling at steady state. Uh, for calculations, uh, we typically uh, apply uh, conservation of mass. Uh, this is both for dry air and water vapor, as well as uh, we can use conservation of energy uh, principle for the air conditioning processes uh, and uh, conservation of mass uh, for example for uh, dry air uh, or water uh, can be represented by these uh, equations as you can see here uh, assuming that uh, we have a control volume system where we receive some incoming air and uh, some of the air and the air leaves from that control volume system uh, 
and as you can see in these equations the I uh, uh, and E uh, represents the inlet and exit uh, states uh, respectively so for dry air mass the conservation of mass states that the incoming air uh, dry air mass equals to the uh, dry mass of the total dry mass of the air exiting the control volume uh, and f similarly for uh, water mass balance we have the total amount of uh, 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 water mass equals to the total amount of mass leaving the uh, control volume system uh, we can represent the amount of water uh, mass by using the dry air mass times the uh, humidity ratio at that state. As you can see, it is defined here for both uh, inlet and exit conditions for that control volume system. And we can also talk about conservation of energy using uh, this uh, equation here for the um, energy conservation. And in this uh, equality here, as you can see, the uh, the capital Q represents the amount of heat transfer and uh, capital W represents the amount of work and that's equal to that difference uh, in the energy term here equals to the total amount of uh, flow energy term uh, flow energy exiting the control volume uh, minus the uh, total amount of flow energy uh, that is entering into the control volume system and for for the flow energy terms uh, we uh, look at uh, the uh, we look at the uh, the mass of uh, total mass of uh, incoming uh, exiting air uh, as well as the enthalpy of the air exiting the uh, control volume system at the inlet condition we look at the mass of incoming air and the enthalpy uh, of the air uh, coming into the uh, control volume system so using these um, mass and uh, energy conservation uh, principles we can uh, we can determine the uh, uh, the amount of heating or cooling or uh, humidification or dehumidification uh, 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 processes uh, or the amounts uh, in a in a in a given uh, psychrometric process so let's look at the sensible heating process as an example a sensible heating process involves uh, the heat transfer only by sensible heat uh, let's remember that this is the amount of heat that we feel uh, actually uh, so uh, by knowing uh, the uh, the change of enthalpy from state 1 to state 2 uh, as well as knowing the uh, the total amount of uh, air mass uh, we can determine the total energy added to the air uh, by looking at the enthalpy differences and uh, the uh, the amount of uh, mass of uh, uh, dry air so let's assume that we have a control volume system represented by this duct uh, system here uh, uh, initially uh, the state point is defined at uh, one and uh, the final state is represented by point two here so the sensible heating process occurs uh, on a horizontal line where the humidity ratio remains uh, constant as you can see on this uh, schematics here we have an incoming air defined by uh, its temperature dry bulb temperature humidity ratio and relative humidity going through uh, heating coils uh, in this process uh, receiving a certain amount of heat and uh, as you can imagine the dry bulb temperature will be increased while the relative humidity is decreased and you can observe that also here on the psychrometric chart uh, as you can see the relative humidity at state point one is uh, much higher than the relative humidity at state point two uh, however um, you will see that uh, during the sensible heating process the humidity ratio remains constant so the related uh, mass and um, energy balance uh, terms uh, for this process is that the amount of mass dry mass uh, uh, going into the uh, control volume here equals to to the, uh, the total amount of uh, dry air mass leaving the system and we can represent that by the a single uh, dry air mass term as you can see here by ma 
and uh, we already mentioned that the humidity ratio remains constant between the initial and final states so we can determine the total amount of uh, heat transfer to the incoming air by the uh, difference in enthalpy, uh, specific enthalpy and that is multiplied by the total amount of dry mass so we can find uh, the, um, the uh, uh, heating received in terms of uh, total energy units. However, we can also find the amount of total heat uh, in terms of mass basis. So we only look at, in this case, the, um, the difference between the uh, specific enthalpy terms uh, between the initial and between the final and initial uh, state points. Uh, let's look at this example. Um, uh, for the uh, sensible heating um, uh, case, uh, we have a moist air uh, initially at uh, f uh, 45 Fahrenheit dry bulb temperature with a relative humidity of 80%. Uh, entering a heating coil at uh, a given uh, volumetric flow rate, and uh, that is about 10 feet cube per meter uh, volumetric flow rate, and this air exits the coil, the heating coil section uh, with a dry bulb temperature of 84 Fahrenheit and at 20% uh, relative humidity. So we are asked to determine the psychrometric properties of the moist air, uh, incoming air, and the air leaving the, um, the heating coil section. As well as uh, we will need to determine the rate of heat transfer uh, to the air from the uh, heating coil uh, section. And if uh, we run this uh, uh, coil um, for 10 minutes, uh, then what would be the total heat added uh, to the air in this uh, process? So um, let's uh, try to find uh, first our um, state points uh, and all other uh, related uh, thermodynamic properties at a given state. So in the, the initial state, we know the dry bulb temperature and, uh, and relative humidity uh, using the procedures described earlier and using the psychrometric chart, we can determine uh, the wet bulb temperature humidity ratio, specific uh, enthalpy, as well as the uh, specific volume of the air coming into this uh, control volume or through the heating coil system. And similarly, we can also determine all other um, thermodynamic properties for final state, which is after the heating coil section. And uh, knowing the uh, uh, two state variables for the final state and dry bulb temperature as well as the uh, relative humidity, we can determine dew point temperature, uh, humidity ratio, and specific enthalpy for the final state. So in order to answer uh, the, um, uh, the question of how much heat is added during this process, we will need to know the enthalpies for each state and also the total uh, mass of dry air. We already determined the specific enthalpies using the psychrometric chart for initial state and final state. So we only need to determine the total mass of the dry uh, air. If you remember, the uh, question provided us the uh, volumetric flow rate for this process and using the psychrometric chart we determine the uh, specific volume of the incoming air so using these uh, two values uh, we can uh, determine the mass uh, flow rate and here the dot represents actually uh, the flow rate but not the uh, the amount of uh, dry air mass um, and uh, going back to the um, analysis here we have 10 feet cube per minute volumetric flow rate and a specific volume of 12.8 feet cube per pound uh, using the uh, uh, the units here. Uh, we determine that we have 0.78 pounds per minute uh, dry air mass uh, going into the heating coil uh, section. So uh, the rate of heat added to the air is then um, 
the uh, multiplication of uh, total air mass, uh, mass flow rate of uh, dry air times the specific enthalpy difference between the initial and final state uh, that uh, gives us uh, 7.41 BTUs per pound. Remember that the unit for uh, dry air mass here is pound per minute times the, uh, the specific enthalpy, which is BTUs per pound. Uh, so the pound terms cancels out. Uh, that leaves us uh, BTUs per minute uh, unit for the total amount of heat added to the air. So if we run uh, this um, uh, heating coil for about 10 minutes, then we multiply the uh, the amount of uh, heat energy per uh, time basis, and the amount of time here is multiplied to to determine what is the total amount of heat added in terms of uh, BTUs. So we have about 74.1 BTUs of uh, heat energy added uh, to the uh, incoming air in this process. Um, as you can see from the previous example in our discussion with the sensible uh, heating, uh, through the sensible heating process, the relative humidity of the air is reduced. Uh, so in, in terms of air conditioning applications, for certain air conditioning applications, uh, the sensible heating creates a very dry air and that may not be very comfortable. And in some industrial processes, we also need some uh, humidity and moisture in the air. Uh, an alternative process to sensible heating is a heating with humidification process, as, uh, uh, as you can see uh, on the schematics here. So in this case, we have an incoming air here at state point one that goes through the heating coils and we reach to state point two. Uh, so until here, uh, it's uh, the process we discussed earlier. That's the sensible heating process. From state two to three, we add some moisture, some steam to the air uh, to increase the relative humidity and the, um, and, and the absolute humidity of the air. So. Here is this heating section and here is the humidification section. Uh, so this is a combined uh, process of heating and with uh, humidification. As you can imagine and remember that uh, there, during the sensible heating process at the heating section, the absolute humidity remains constant. However, because of uh, the uh, addition of steam here, the absolute humidity at the final state, at state three, will be uh, higher than the humidity uh, ratio or absolute humidity of air. Uh, at the state point uh, two. Um, so we can uh, write uh, the, uh, uh, we can represent the rate of energy added to the moist air during the sensible heating process uh, using this uh, equation here. That's the enthalpy difference times the dry air mass. And this is the amount of heat added during the heating section here, during the sensible heating process. Um, uh, we can also determine the uh, the uh, the uh, amount of uh, uh, energy uh, in the humidification process uh, using this equation here. As you can see, the uh, the amount of uh, uh, heat, <coughs> the amount of energy added uh, between uh, point uh, three or final point and uh, uh, state point two. Uh, equals to the uh, the uh, the energy total amount of energy that is uh, received by the uh, steam injection using its uh, uh, mass flow rate for the water uh, or the steam coming in as well as its related uh, specific enthalpy of that steam. So uh, the rate of moisture, if we are interested in determining what is the rate of moisture uh, between state point two and three uh, through the steam injection, uh, we can determine that amount of water added by looking at the difference between the humidity ratios uh, or absolute humidities between those two uh, state points. And we can multiply that by the uh, dry air mass to determine the total amount of uh, mass uh, 
uh, flow rate for the water or for the steam uh, injection in this uh, humidification process. So let's look at an example for heating and uh, humidification. Uh, we have an air conditioning system uh, that is taking an outside air at 10 degrees Celsius with 30% uh, relative humidity at a steady state rate of uh, 45 meters cubed per meter volumetric flow rate and it's conditioning that air to 25 degrees Celsius and 60% uh, relative humidity. Uh, the outdoor air is first heated to 22 degrees Celsius in the heating section uh, before a hot steam is injected into the uh, uh, dry air uh, in the humidification section of this uh, process. Uh, we are going to assume that the process uh, is taking place at the atmospheric pressure of uh, 101 uh, kilopascal. And the question is asking us to determine what is the rate of heat supply in the heating section, then what is the mass flow rate of steam injection uh, required in this uh, humidification uh, process in the uh, humidifying section. So uh, the summary of uh, all the given uh, variables are uh, shown on this slide on the psychrometric chart here, as well as uh, uh, demonstrating the control volume system with the known and with the given uh, information. As you can see here, initially the outside air is at 10 degrees Celsius, 30% relative humidity. We go through a sensible heating process during the heating section where the humidity ratio remains constant. So we have a horizontal process line and from state point two to three, we have a steam injection. So the humidity ratio is increased. Uh, between these two state points, as you can see, uh, the relative humidity is also increased relative to um, uh, state point two when compared to state point uh, three. So the process, the processes are shown in the psychrometric chart here, and uh, we can also uh, construct our um, uh, mass balances as well as the energy balance uh, in these processes. Um, uh, to, to, to be able to answer the question uh, in this example. So um, we will need the, um, uh, the enthalpy differences between state point two and one during the heating section to be able to answer uh, what is the amount of heat added during this process. And then uh, we will need to determine the absolute humidities between state point two and three uh, in order to determine how much water or steam is injected during the humidification process. So using the psychrometric chart and the information given by the problem, we can first determine the state point one and the corresponding enthalpy as well as specific volume and then we can locate the specific enthalpy at state point two. That also helps us to determine the initial uh, and um, uh, the humidity ratios at state point one and two uh, during the heating section, as you can see here with this uh, value. Uh, and uh, the final state, uh, we know uh, two variables for final state. Uh, then we can determine the humidity ratio at this final state as well. So remembering those uh, values from the psychrometric chart and we can summarize them on a table here, as you can see for state point one, two, and after the steam injection, we have the enthalpies, we have the humidity ratios as well as the specific volume. So uh, in order to answer uh, the question of how much heat is added during the heating section, we will first need to determine the mass flow rate uh, of the dry air. Uh, as you can remember in the previous example uh, question, we also uh, went through this analysis. We, the, we know the flow rate from the problem and we determine the, uh, the uh, incoming air uh, specific volume using the psychrometric chart, as you can see here. So we know the mass flow rate of dry air as 55.9 kilograms per um, minute. 
So by knowing the uh, the enthalpies uh, during the heating section uh, uh, using the psychrometric chart uh, and the mass flow rate of dry air, we can uh, say that we have 670 kilojoules per minute uh, uh, rate of heat supply during the heating section. Um, we can also determine the mass flow rate of the steam injection uh, required in this uh, humidification process because we already determined the absolute humidity of the final state as well as the state 2. At state 2 we know the humidity ratio from the psychrometric chart and then by knowing the uh, mass flow rate of dry air we can determine that we have a, a mass flow rate of steam at about uh, 0.542 uh, kilograms of water per minute basis. As you can see here, um, by knowing the mass and energy balances for any given system and being able to utilize our knowledge of using psychrometric uh, chart with the given state thermodynamic properties, uh, we can easily uh, calculate the energy loads um, and uh, uh, the amount of water evaporation or water addition to this uh, system uh, during any given uh, thermodynamic or psychrometric uh, processes. <clears throat> Another uh, example process, uh, psychrometric process uh, or air conditioning process is cooling with uh, humidification. Uh, and in this process, uh, um, this process involves both removal of water vapor from the system and heat uh, from the moist air. Therefore, the uh, energy balance equation uh, must include a change in enthalpy as well as a term for the uh, moisture removal from the system and that, are, that uh, they are both in, in forms of wa uh, water vapor and liquid condensate that will likely form uh, on the uh, cooling coil. So here's an example for a cooling uh, with dehumidification. Uh, uh, we have an air uh, entering a window of air conditioning at the atmospheric pressure of one uh, atmosphere with 30 degrees Celsius and 80% relative humidity uh, with a known volumetric flow rate and that's 10 meters cubed per minute and um, this air leaves um, as satura saturated air from the cooling coil section at 14 degrees Celsius. So part of this moist air, uh, moisture in the air, uh, condenses out from the uh, cooling coil during the process and, and that condensate is removed also at 14 uh, degrees uh, Celsius. So the question uh, is asking us to determine what is the rate of heat and moisture removal from the air in this process. And we can summarize uh, uh, all the given variables on this uh, schematics. As you can see, we have uh, a control volume um, and the initial air is defined by temperature uh, with its relative humidity and the volumetric flow rate. We have the cooling coil section. Uh, the problem mentioned that the condensate uh, is leaving from the cooling coil at uh, 14 degrees Celsius and the conditioned air is uh, also uh, leaving the uh, control volume section of this cooling coil section at 14 degrees Celsius as saturated air. So that's why the relative humidity is at 100% uh, level. Uh, so if we summarize our mass uh, balances for uh, dry air uh, component as well as the uh, water uh, co water vapor um, content, uh, we can write these uh, equations. Um, so the amount of water uh, leaving uh, the system as a condensate is going to be the, uh, the difference between the absolute humidities uh, from the initial state and the final state. 
and the energy balance is shown by this equation here as you can see in this process we don't have a work uh, term so the amount of cooling uh, or the energy by cooling equals to the difference uh, between the um, uh, flow energy terms uh, the energy uh, that is um, uh, carried out by the uh, air leaving the control volume here at the exit as well as the flow energy term uh, the energy that is brought into the control volume by the incoming air and that's represented by the total mass of the incoming air as well as the enthalpy of the air here uh, we can further write uh, or expand this uh, energy balance term uh, using our knowledge of total layer mass and enthalpy at any given point. As you can see here, uh, this is for uh, state 2 uh, for uh, dry air mass and enthalpy minus the incoming air dry air mass and its uh, enthalpy, specific enthalpy, plus uh, the the energy term that is related with the condensate uh, water mass as well as the uh, specific enthalpy of the uh, the condensate at that saturation so uh, in order to answer the uh, question uh, about what is the um, uh, the cooling the rate of heat and moisture removal uh, from the air in this process uh, and using our um, equations and mass and energy balances um, and using the psychromatic chart as you can see here we are all again summarizing all the state uh, thermodynamic properties uh, at given um, conditions uh, we are able to determine the uh, absolute humidity as well as specific enthalpy and specific uh, volume of the incoming air and at the condensate section at the cooling coil uh, we know that uh, the temperature as well as uh, uh, the, the relative humidity which is at saturation so we know the specific volume as well as the uh, specific enthalpy of that condensate we can determine that uh, using a thermodynamic um, uh, book uh, book value uh, for that state um, and the exiting air from that uh, cooling coil section, uh, we know the um, uh, wall, uh, the absolute uh, humidity as well as the enthalpy because we know uh, two uh, state variables for that state as well. So these values are all obtained from the uh, psychromatic chart, uh, similar to the procedure we described in the previous uh, several sets of uh, examples and discussions. So, um, in order to determine how much uh, uh, water is, uh, uh, is condensing out from the cooling coil, we will need to determine the amount of mass uh, of dry air. Uh, again, remember that we know the mass flow, uh, sorry, the volumetric flow uh, rate, as well as the specific volume of the incoming air. So, we can determine the total mass of uh, dry air as 11.3 kilograms per minute and uh, using the um, the balance energy uh, the the mass balance equation for the amount of condensate we know the dry air mass as well as the difference uh, between the humidity ratios uh, from the uh, the initial and final state points we can determine the amount of water that is condensing out from that cooling coil surface and that's about 0 0.013 kilograms of water per minute basis so in order to determine the uh, the amount of uh, cooling that's happening during this uh, uh, cooling with the humidification process we are going to look at the um, enthalpy differences uh, between uh, uh, the initial and final uh, state as well as the the uh, the energy that is uh, involved in this process because of the the water and its related enthalpy at that saturation so if we do this analysis uh, we will see that we have a negative uh, amount of uh, energy by heat transfer 
uh, that uh, that uh, that means that the minus sign here uh, means that the energy is lost from the system and that defines the cooling process in this uh, air conditioning application. Um, another uh, example um, a process for air conditioning or psychometric process is the evaporative cooling process. Over the cooling process is also defined as an adiabatic uh, process, meaning that there is no energy transfer to or from the system. Uh, however, the uh, the energy is transformed from sensible heat to latent heat in this uh, in this air conditioning uh, process. Uh, conventional cooling systems operate on a refrigeration cycle, on a thermodynamic refrigeration cycle and they can be used in any part of the world. Uh, however, they have high initial and, uh, high initial and uh, operational uh, costs. In desert climates where the air is hot and dry, the evaporative coolers um, or swamp coolers can be used to avoid um, high cost of uh, cooling. An example system using the cooling uh, application uh, is uh, the uh, the fan and pad system uh, used for greenhouse uh, and for plant production uh, in greenhouses. Uh, the wet walls are located on one side of the greenhouse wall, uh, as well as the um, exhaust fans are located on the opposite side of the uh, wet wall. The hot and dry air is brought and passes through the uh, um, uh, the wet wall uh, and goes through the canopy and is exhausted through the exhaust fans on the other side of the greenhouse wall. Uh, the evaporative cooling systems uh, do not uh, uh, work efficiently in in humid and hot regions because uh, the air does not have capacity to cool uh, at higher higher uh, higher temperatures and with higher relative uh, humidity levels. So this system could work, for example, in an in a climate like Arizona climate, and it may not function well. Uh, for example, in 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 a humid condition or hot condition, uh, uh, which is uh, similar conditions, uh, for example, in Georgia or Alabama or other places during the, uh, the hot and humid summer months. Uh, here's an example for uh, such process uh, for the evaporative cooling. So we have an outside air entering a greenhouse pad or wet wall at 95 degrees Fahrenheit and 20% relative humidity. That's a very dry air and with high temperatures. And that air enters the greenhouse interior at 80% relative humidity. So as you can see, the humidity is increased uh, uh, dramatically here after that air passes through the wet pad. So the question is asking us to determine what is the exit temperature of the air from the pad. That means the, 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 the air temperature, dry bulb temperature right after the air passes through the wet pad in, into the greenhouse space. And uh, again, the question is, what would be the lowest temperature to which the air can be cooled by a pad and fan system? And this is the minimum temperature we can achieve, assuming that we have a 100% efficient evaporative cooling uh, system or pad system. And uh, again, we will need to determine in this example what would be the cooling pad efficiency uh, depending on the outside conditions and the the interior conditions, air conditions that we uh, provide or maintain uh, using this evaporative cooling uh, system application. So let's look at this schematics here for this process. As you can see, we have the outcome out, uh, outside air with 95 uh, degrees Fahrenheit at 20 degree 20 percent relative humidity going through the wet pad and its humidity is increased to 85 80 percent here and we see the direction of the flow and the air exits from the uh, exhaust fan 
um, as I mentioned, uh, this is a very effective cooling uh, system uh, as an advantage. However, the disadvantage is that the, since this is a mechanical ventilation system, a lot of uh, energy is consumed by the exhaust fans as well as the 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 sump pump that circulates the water on the uh, wet pad surface. Another disadvantage is that uh, we achieve cooler temperatures close to the wet pad while the um, air uh, warms up a little bit as it goes through the uh, length of the greenhouse and we may see um, uh, a temperature gradient between the wet pad zone as well as closer to the uh, exhaust fan uh, area. Um, we can uh, demonstrate this process on the psychrometric chart and uh, we can determine the state properties again similar to the procedure we described earlier in the earlier examples. So the outside air uh, was given with uh, 95 uh, degrees Fahrenheit as well as 20% relative humidity as you can see. So we can cross those two. Uh, lines here to determine the uh, state point for the outside air or incoming air uh, through the pad. Uh, and uh, as we know that the evaporative cooling process is a constant wet bulb temperature process. Uh, in other words, it's an adiabatic uh, process. Uh, so the wet bulb uh, temperature remains constant, so that's why we are following this wet bulb, uh, constant wet bulb curve as the air goes through the wet pad and we will go uh, until uh, we uh, reach to the 80% relative humidity uh, that the, the, the example problem mentioned that after the wet pad, the relative humidity is 80%. So uh, that's our final state after the wet pad. So uh, moving down vertically to the uh, dry bulb temperature scale here, you can see that the, the dry bulb temperature after the wet pad is about 70.4 Fahrenheit. So you can see the cooling effect of this earth to cooling process going from 95 degrees Fahrenheit to down to 70.4 Fahrenheit. It's a very effective uh, way of cooling, as you can see in the hot and dry uh, climate. So um, in order to find the uh, minimum uh, or the lowest uh, dry bulb uh, temperature or the air temperature after wet pad, uh, we need to follow the constant wet bulb uh, curve here until we reach to the 100% relative humidity or to the saturation point. Uh, and at that point, as you can see, the dry bulb temperature equals to the wet bulb temperature of the air. So moving uh, down vertical to the dry bulb uh, temperature scale here, you can see that the minimum temperature we can achieve in this process is about 66 Fahrenheit. Again, this may not be achieved in real world conditions uh, because uh, this requires a 100% efficient uh, cooling pad. Uh, the final section of the question asked us to determine what is the pad uh, efficiency or cooling efficiency of this pad. So we can use this uh, equation uh, here to determine the pad efficiency. And in this equation, as you can see, we are looking at the, uh, the amount of cooling, uh, the ratio of amount of cooling to the maximum cooling that we can achieve. So we look at the a difference between outside dry bulb temperature and the uh, dry bulb temperature of the uh, air uh, inside the greenhouse and uh, the ratio uh, to the uh, the uh, the maximum amount of cooling that we can achieve and that's defined by the outside dry bulb and the the wet bulb of the outside air. The, the denominator of this equation is actually called the, uh, the wet bulb depression. Uh, that means the maximum amount of cooling that we can achieve in this process. So 
by using the values for each corresponding variable here we have 95 degrees Fahrenheit for outside dry bulb 70.4 dry bulb temperature for the air uh, inside the greenhouse again the wet bulb temperature of the air is uh, 66 Fahrenheit so the uh, the cooling efficiency of this pad is about 85% uh, uh, as you can see in this uh, example. So uh, we can summarize our findings from this evaporative cooling process. Uh, as you will remember the, uh, the values that we achieved uh, using the psychrometric chart and the knowledge that we use uh, uh, in this example for this uh, 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 evaporative cooling uh, process. There are uh, different types of sensors used for um, measuring psychrometric properties of moist air. For example, uh, dry and wet bulb thermometers. These are also called psychrometers and uh, there are also dry bulb and relative humidity sensors. Uh, the challenges um, uh, that are faced uh, measuring psychrometric properties with sensor applications are uh, instrument accuracies, uh, uh, the dry and wet bulb thermometers, psychrometers need continuous wetting of the wet bulb sensor so we need to make sure that there's always uh, water in the reservoir of these sensor uh, units and uh, another concern is that uh, we need to prevent these uh, sensors from direct uh, uh, solar radiation by shielding the sensors. These, these are the uh, challenges uh, uh, to operate um, uh, uh, psychrometers and, uh, and, um, and sensors for psychrometric uh, property uh, measurements. Uh, there are also new humidity sensors out there. They are uh, solid state sensors. They either measure the capacitance or inductance of a material as water molecules uh, adhere uh, to the uh, surface. Here's an example of a psychrometer uh, called a sling psychrometer. We have two uh, thermometers, liquid and glass thermometers here. Uh, one without a wet wick that measures the dry bulb temperature of the air and the other one uh, has a wet wick uh, that is always saturated so we're measuring the wet bulb temperature and uh, we can spun uh, this psychrometer around in the air until the uh, both thermometers uh, reach to the equilibrium at the equilibrium we can uh, determine or read uh, of the dry bulb and wet bulb temperatures so we can determine relative humidity and uh, all other uh, psychrometric properties again using a psychrometric chart. Another example uh, psychrometer is called Asman psychrometer. In this case uh, we have an aspirator here that uh, draws air automatically uh, once uh, the aspirator is, is adjusted. Uh, so the air is uh, air is brought into these tubes uh, moving uh, through the uh, liquid and glass uh, thermometers again one measures the dry bulb temperature while the other one having a wet wick on it measures wet bulb temperatures uh, there are also um, other types of simple uh, psychrometers, dry bulb and wet bulb uh, psychrometers, as you can see here, using liquid and glass uh, uh, thermometers. Uh, again, just to remember that uh, for the wet bulb uh, temperature measurement, uh, we need to make sure that there's always water in the reservoir uh, for psychrometric uh, property measurements. Thank you very much for listening.